Thank you for waiting. Here's channel 1. This is thematic session 5 by ADV and ADVI. Session title is Integrated Approaches for Low Carbon and Resilient Cities. Now, I'd like to introduce the speakers. Mr. Saito Norio, Director, Urban Development and Water Division, South Asia Department, Asian Development Bank. Mr. Arno Heckman, Principal Urban Development Specialist, Urban and Social Sector Division, East Asia Department, Asian Development Bank. Mr. Chong Quan Chan, Chief of Industrial Promotion, Da Nang City, Vietnam. Ms. Nirari Mango, Urban Data Specialist, ETH Future Cities Lab, Singapore. The moderator is Ms. Jimin Fan, Director, Urban Development Water Division, Pacific Department, Asian Development Bank. Ms. Jimin, please start the session. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Moon. Uh, I would like to just briefly review some uh, housekeeping items before uh, handing it over to Ms. Jingmin Huang. So good day, everyone. This is Chris Moon from Asian Development Bank. Welcome to the ADB ADBI joint session on integrated approaches for low carbon and resilient cities at the 10th Asian Smart Cities Conference. So this is one hour session. It will be moderated by Ms. Jingmin Huang as introduced, the Director of Asia Pacific Asia Urban and Water Division at ADB. Uh, so before we start, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, speakers and panelists, please put on your videos on throughout the session, but keep yourself on mute when not speaking. Uh, please also keep your chat box open as we will alert you of remaining time through the chat box. Uh, we ask you please to keep the allocated time. Thank you for that in advance. Uh, to our audience, welcome. Uh, please keep your microphones on mute and cameras off throughout the session until the Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box. Uh, without further ado, I would like to now invite Ms. Wong to lead the session. So Ms. Wong. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon to all participants and uh, good day. Welcome to uh, Asia Smart City Conference. Uh, this uh, session is an uh, integrated approach for low carbon and resilient cities, co-organized by ADB and ADBI. I'm Jing Ming. Um, I'm very happy to join this uh, session. Uh, this is a very timely conference as uh, the 2021 uh, United Nations uh, Climate Change Conference, COP26, will be held in Glasgow next week. It is a key to adopt a low carbon and resilient recovery for urban development so we can build back and better. This uh, um, session is uh, about how we can uh, do well in this low carbon and resilient development. Uh, first, let's welcome Mr. Norio Sato uh, to give a keynote speech. And as a, uh, um, Organizer has introduced uh, Norio is the director of urban and water division in South Asia department. Uh, he has more than 27 years of uh, professional experience across Asia, primarily in uh, urban development, water and sanitation management, climate change, environmental analysis, and uh, municipal governance. In his current position as a director, Norio is responsible for significant project lending and technical assistance. Um, involving the following uh, ADB development member countries, uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, and uh, Sri Lanka. His career includes the role of deputy country director for ADB's uh, Vietnam Residential Mission, as well as the uh, senior positions uh, with uh, Japan Bank for International Cooperation. He has a PhD in environmental science from uh, Ibaraki University, Japan, our Master of Environmental Management from Duke University, USA, and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Tokyo, uh, Japan. So, Norio, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you, Jimin. And may I request to upload uh, the PowerPoint on the screen? Thank you. Okay, thank you for giving me a chance to speak uh, in this important event today. 
I would like to talk about ADB's operations for accelerating climate and disaster resilience and the low carbon development in cities. This topic is quite timely, as Jimmy mentioned, when the COP26 is just going to start in three days. Okay, the PowerPoint is back now, I think. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so firstly, Asia accounts for over 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and the CO2 emissions are rapidly rising with economic growth. While the average growth rate in CO2 emissions is slowing down with rapid increase in renewable energy, as you can see on the left-hand side, um, it is clear from the graph on the right side that the current policies and commitments in nationally determined contributions or NDCs will not take us even near to the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. So ADB president recently stated the battle against climate change will be won or lost in Asia and the Pacific, and we need to win this battle with much more substantive efforts. Next, please. So cities occupy only 2% of the world's land, but consume about 75% of its resources. So here, crucial roles of cities are highlighted. So cities generate CO2, but also suffer from climate change. Almost every year, we see news that major cities are flooded somewhere in Asia. Cities in Asia and the Pacific have large population in low-income settlements, and these people are disproportionately affected by urban flooding. So cities need better services, such as water supply and sanitation. And the COVID-19 pandemic has made clear that these improvements have to be inclusive. On the other hand, cities where people and the economy concentrate have a great potential in providing necessary services to citizens in a resource efficient manner through climate resilient and low carbon development. Next, please. So this slide shows uh, ADB's commitment in the urban sector in 2020. So ADB supports urban projects through financing, knowledge, and partnership. Most of the financing is for infrastructure, such as water supply, sanitation, sewage, and the flood protection. But support is also provided for policy, institutional, and capacity development to advance reforms and enhance sustainability. Among the sub-regions, as you can see on the left-hand side, South Asia accounts for nearly 50% of ADB's urban sector investment. So I would like to very briefly uh, introduce two projects next to give you a flavor of what ADB is doing. Next, please. So this is the green and resilient affordable housing sector project in Bhutan. To build about 1,000 affordable housing units to low-income households in major urban centers with 30 million financing from ADB. So the project is planned for approval by the end of this year. So housing, housing design incorporates seismic resistant and green resilient design, as well as gender inclusive features, and intends to achieve green building certification, first of its kind in Bhutan. ADB also intends to support strengthening national code, building code and rate guidelines to make them more disaster resilient and green. Next, please. Yeah, this is an integrated urban flood management project uh, in Chennai in India. So the project was just approved by ADB board last month with ADB financing of $251 million. As some people may recall, Chennai had a devastating flood in 2015 that claimed more than 400 lives. So this project offers an integrated solution for the urban floods by combining structural and non-structural measures to reduce flood risks. So in addition to the climate resilient infrastructure, the project will enhance urban flood preparedness and establish measures for sustaining operation and maintenance. So the project design includes integrated urban planning by linking 
flood hazard zoning with land use planning and green solutions. A grant from the Global Environmental Facility is now being processed, which will provide nature-based solutions for water body rejuvenation. Next, please. So in a concerted effort by multilateral development banks on combating climate change, Paris Agreement Alignment Framework has been developed with six building blocks. ADB has committed to align its operations with the Paris Agreement and ensure all project activities advance low carbon climate resilient development pathways, or at least result in no harm to these Paris Agreement goals to start with. So ADB will achieve full alignment of its operations, its sovereign operations, by 1st July 2023 on do no harm basis and its non sovereign operations by 1st July 2025. So ADB will scale up adaptation and resilience investments to $9 billion during 2019 to 2024. So this is a significant increase from the last couple of years when uh, climate adaptation, adaptation financing was on average about $1 billion a year. So out of the $9 billion, the urban sector will contribute about $2.5 billion. So just two weeks ago, as you can see at the bottom here, ADB announced to elevate our ambition to $100 billion in cumulative climate finance from our own resources from 2019 to 2030, compared to the original target of $80 billion. So additional amount will come from five main areas. One, climate mitigation, including energy storage, energy efficiency, and low carbon transport. Two, a scale up of transformative adaptation projects in climate sensitive sectors such as urban and water. Three, uh, increasing climate finance in private sector operations in ADP. Four, support for a clean, resilient, and inclusive recovery from COVID 19. And five, lastly, support to advance reforms in policies and institutions for enhanced climate resilience and climate mitigation in our member countries. Uh, next, next, please. So this last slide uh, indicates key pillars of operational priority for making cities more livable under ADB strat strategy 2030 and our build back better approach during and after the pandemic indicated in the guidance note on COVID-19 and livable cities. So ensuring low carbon uh, climate resilient future is crucial in urban projects as urban carbon, carbon footprint in cities is disproportionately high. So improving urban environment, climate resilience and disaster management of cities is therefore imperative. And we at the ADB consider this as one of the priority pillars as a critical direction towards making cities more livable in Asia and the Pacific. I also wish to stress the importance of digital technologies to deliver better urban services more efficiently and sustainably. Moving forward, more concerted actions are needed by cities and countries, and ADB plans to work with a wide range of stakeholders to support more climate resilient and low carbon development of cities in Asia and the Pacific. Yeah, that's all from me, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Norio san for sharing these innovative urban projects uh, in uh, South Asia. Uh, it is really important to align ADB operations so, with Paris Agreement. Your keynote paved a very good way for us to move forward with a further discussion. Uh, let's welcome our three panelists uh, representing three key player groups in urban development. Uh, Mr. Arnold Heckman, Principal Urban Development Specialist uh, from ADB, representing their financing partners. And Mr. Uh, Chuan Kuan Chan, uh, Chief of uh, Industrial Promotion, Danan City in Vietnam, um, from Municipal Management uh, Angle and uh, Ms. Narali Mungo, uh, ETH Future City Lab, representing the most advanced pilot work on resilient and smart city development. Uh, first, uh, let's welcome Arnold Heckman. Uh, he has been working for East Asian Department, China and Mongolia for a very long time, processing, administrating, 
integrated economic and urban development projects and technical assistance. Um, all the projects promote uh, inclusive and green livable cities, climate change adaptation and mitigation, uh, environmental sustainability, and uh, urban rural integration. And he holds a master's degree in comparative uh, development research from EHESS, Paris School of High Study in Social Science, and a master's degree in human geography from Toulouse University, and a diploma in Chinese language and culture from Paris University. Arnold, uh, could you please uh, share with us uh, your experience in design and implementing the low carbon project and what uh, your lessons learned? Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tingming, and a very good morning, afternoon, and evening to everybody. I'm, I'm very happy to be here uh, and to present, especially the, the case of Mongolia for an integrated approach of uh, urban and urban rural development. Uh, if if uh, we can upload the uh, PowerPoint, please. Here it is. Yes. Yeah, because I think you know this uh, this case is a very inter interesting case of uh, uh, integrated approach, and not only in the urban area itself. Uh, we know the importance of integrated solution for urban area, but to replace also urban in the context of the territorial development. Uh, urban area are the key uh, uh, are a key element of a country or province or a regional development. So by by having an integrated approach of cities and the impact on the urban rural linkage, we can have not only a low carbon and resilient uh, urban development, but uh, uh, promote a, a green, low, uh, low carbon and resilient uh, territorial development. And this is uh, actually what we have, uh, we have done for the IMAG and Sung Green Regional Development Investment Program in Mongolia. Uh, can I have a uh, next slide, please? And, uh, Next slide, please. Okay, let me continue. Uh, if you can put the slide just after. Uh, why, why we are doing those integrated approach and, and why we are taking also the, you know, the even an integrated territorial development approach. Uh, can you move a little bit up the, the slide, please? Uh, it's not because we like to complicate our life. It's because you know the situation uh, uh, on the ground is complex, and you know don't be afraid by this slide. But it shows the complexity of the linkage between all the elements that uh, promote uh, um, regional development. So here in Mongolia, for example, uh, in the, in the province of Mongolia, we have urban uh, uh, urban environment which is lacking of basic infrastructure, highly polluting, not livable not providing the level of services to uh, uh, to the population but also to the uh, to the businesses or to cooperative and and the rural development and on the other hand as you can guess you know the mongolia economy is, is really uh, relying on on the uh, agri business and and livestock sector and the livestock sector is facing a huge challenges uh, why is because there is a, a, a huge degradation a process in the rangeland of Mongolia. And this degradation is mainly due to the vulnerable, vulnerability of elders. Uh, and why is that is because every, uh, I mean, so, uh, in some years, uh, there is a, a harsh climate events that really uh, kills a lot of livestock. And, and the mechanism for the elders to compensate that is to produce more livestock. And so, so the the all rural economy is set to quantity and not quality and this quantity of livestock is exponential as you can see on the small graph on the left it has it has been multiplied by 3 during the last uh, last uh, uh, 15 years so the impact on the rangeland is huge it makes the rangeland less productive which has an impact on the elders vulnerability and etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, so uh, and also one of the big impact of the rangeland degradation is uh, it, it lowers the capacity of the rangeland to sequester carbon. So it means like uh, above and below ground of biomass is decreasing and releasing a CO2 emission uh, uh, um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the atmosphere. 
And finally, one of the huge uh, uh, problem is the attraction of, of uh, uh, businesses in those areas. So there is a very weak value chain uh, in place. Uh, there is not incentives to develop value chain. Uh, most of the uh, processing facilities are around the Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, and there is no really uh, uh, job creation and job development uh, on, the, on the spot at the point of need. And if you look at those three elements, you try to solve them separately. Uh, it, it, it is not efficient and sustainable. You, you invest in infrastructure for the urban uh, areas to make them more resilient and, uh, and, and low carbon. But if there is no job, then you, lo you lose efficiency. If you, if you try to solve the issue of the rangeland and the elders, to, for the elders to have a more sustainable rangeland management approaches, but there is no uh, service uh, for, uh, for the elders at the urban level. And if there is no value change to buy uh, the material from the elders, then it's not sustainable. And, and if you try to uh, pro uh, provide financing for the value chain, and uh, and uh, and and there is no I mean, and, and the quality of the uh, animals are low, then it doesn't work. Uh, next slide, please. So that's why we have developed this uh, very comprehensive and integrated approach, not only for urban area but for the entire uh, territorial development to promote green territorial development in uh, Mongolia provinces, uh, green urban rural linkage, and to use human uh, settlement as an anchor for green agribusiness development. Uh, and the, really the, the strategic objective is inclusive green urban rural transformation, sustainable climate resilient and low carbon rangeland management, and inclusive and green agribusiness development. Uh, all of that's linked with the uh, support for national policy. And this program is a, is a 10 year program with three tranches, focusing on, on one specific area of Mongolia in the Western part for the first tranche and to be replicated in other uh, IMAG, or uh, IMAG means province in, in Mongolia, in other IMAGs of Mongolia. Next slide, please. So how do we do the link and how we make sure that all those elements are integrated? We have four main outputs. First output is to provide, support the uh, infrastructure and services uh, uh, in the urban area to make sure that they are resilient to climate change, they are low carbon, and they provide sufficient services uh, to the population and to the businesses to, uh, to invest in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the secondary cities. And especially by providing small agribusiness park for them to be located uh, at the point of need. Then one uh, the other output is to promote range, sustainable rangeland management, offering services to the elder, establishing cooperative, producing a further irrigation system and certification uh, and certification and traceability system. Those are very important. So basically supporting the uh, elders to move to a more sustainable rangeland management, lower the number of livestock and move from uh, quantity to, uh, to quality. And one very important element is the financial intermediation component. Because the financial intermediation component says to the businesses, A, if you, if you invest on the spot in those, uh, in those areas, in the cities, uh, if you invest uh, and put your processing facility in the agro-business park that we have, we have developed for you, and if you partner with the uh, elders and cooperative, which have committed for sustainable rangeland management, then we are going to give you a support for a low interest loan, credit guarantee, and even uh, uh, innovative grant. So we use, we use the market and we use uh, the uh, incentives for businesses to link urban development and rural development all together in a, in a green territorial approach. Uh, next slide, please. So just, just as an example, it shows you here of one of the cities we are targeting the, the overall uh, uh, integrated approach at the city level. So it's not only about water or wastewater or heating system. It includes all the infrastructure gaps that the city are facing to be able to, uh, to develop on a sustainable way and livable way. And we have also mechanism for redeveloping substandard urban areas and creating housing. And if you see on the on the left side, it, 
you you can see the situation of the 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 businesses. They are all now located in Ulaanbaatar. So the idea with with this project is to move back processing facilities, businesses investment in those uh, in those areas at the point of need, which means linked with the with, uh, close to the rangeland and 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 promoting and creating the link between the green development of cities and the green development of the of the rangeland. Next slide, please. So because of this, this scope and integrated approach, uh, we are able also to attract a lot of uh, partner uh, because each uh, each partner, each financial partner have their own agenda, their own objective. So for example, we have worked with the Green Climate Funds to uh, secure uh, uh, 130 million highly concessional loan and 45 million grants uh, uh, from, from the Green Climate Fund. And why is because if, if the rangeland has, are less deteriorated, then the, the biomass will increase and then the carbon sequestration of the rangeland will increase, which leads to the huge potential for carbon sequestration. Actually, those figures are, 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 quite, are quite big. And, uh, and uh, uh, working with GCF, we, I like the fact that even though they are very conservative, they are, they, we, we can still have a huge impact on climate through the rangeland restoration and, and natural uh, uh, capital restoration. Um, we have worked with EIB, which is more focused on resilient and, uh, and, and green infrastructure for urban development. So at the end, we have a huge uh, uh, a program of 735 million on three tranches loaded with a lot of uh, uh, grants. We have even a grant for uh, European Union and also uh, and also leveraging a private, a private sector. So even though it's a financial intermediation, at the end of the day, this will be the private sector who will, be, will reimburse the, the, the government and leveraging also private sector equity. So again, you know, because it's, uh, it's a comprehensive and integrated, we have a lot of different synergetic benefits. Uh, and, and we have seen some of them, but I want to highlight one specific is a, is a green recovery uh, after uh, post COVID-19 green recovery and economic di diversification. We have calculated that if this program is implemented, it will have a huge impact on green job creation. I say green because it will be linked to green agribusiness development. And, uh, and this will have a, a huge impact, not only on the local development, but on the recovery of the economies. And of course, you know, the increase of uh, carbon stock, the uh, natural uh, ecosystem restoration, and the huge uh, adaptation benefits, both from the elders and the countryside and, and, and on the urban area. Next, uh, uh, next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Just, just some takeaway. I think, you know, this is important to emphasize the fact that uh, we have somehow, and for some project, moved from change to transformative. Change is very discrete uh, intervention. You change something, but transformative it means you transform the entire system. And for that, uh, you have to really have those integrated and large scale approaches. And and to develop this, you what is important is to have a strategic development phase and and look at what is the core problem which is uh, really facing those uh, those areas. And those core problem development are very important because there is a lot of stakeholders and the political challenges. So you have to have uh, an angle which, uh, which is relevant and, and cannot be questioned by anybody because of this significance for the country and people development. Uh, and this integrated approach also helps to think on how the private sector can be uh, integrated and also to move from uh, investment to mechanism. And I think this is very important and this is what the uh, the countries are looking more and more. They want some development mechanism, no more investment, because those development mechanisms have uh, more impact and can be after replicated uh, internally. And my last point is, uh, just I want to emphasize this, of course, you know, they are more complex to uh, develop those projects. They require more resources. But uh, so they need to have also, because they are integrated, to have a, a, a very uh, well integrated implementation arrangements uh, for the implementation. Okay, I'm stopping there because I think my, my time is done. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, I learned the importance of uh, strategic development phase, a holistic approach, urban rural integration, and a strong partnership from the financing angle. That's very good. Um, let's move to the city management angle and welcome Mr. 
uh, Chuan Quan Chan, uh, head of uh, Department Center for Industry Promotion for Danan City in Vietnam. He has over 10 years uh, of experience working on planning, organizing, and uh, conducting energy audit, cleaner production assessment. Um, he helps and supports enterprises to implement energy saving and cleaner production solutions, and also uh, works on many international projects. He has been uh, speakers in for many international and national conferences. He holds a bachelor degree of uh, engineering and master degree of technology uh, from Danan University of Science and Technology. Uh, Mr. Chan, um, I just wonder what has uh, promoted you and your city, Danan, to embark on a low carbon and energy saving development roadmap? Uh, is there any plan for near and uh, long term future? Uh, the floor is yours, please. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to join CE Convention. Uh, I, I speak English uh, very bad. Um, my uh, session will help me to present the problem. Yes, I'm here, I'm Mr. Jung Wilson. I'm very happy today to join the conference here. And uh, as you know, on the lower stay on the countries in the world, I join hands to impact on low carbon development. And um, in our city, Da Nang City, Vietnam, all equipments in you are very waste, wasting, and the opportunity to low carbon in this and now, in the conference, I would like to present the plan of the city on a low carbon development trajectory. And below are some policy from the city. Uh, the first one is the D season number 4929, promulgating the implementation plan of the national program on economical and efficient use of energies in Danang City in the periods of 20 to 20, 2020 to 2030. And here are some details, okay? Here are some details of this decision. First one is here about transport. Uh, about transport, we can say at least 2.58% compared to the forecast of the total energy consumption of the whole countries. The second That's issue is that right. agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, we can say at least 2.19% compared to the forecast of total energy consumption of the whole industry. And the last one is that it's here about bubbling lighting. Mm, about public lighting, public lighting, we can say at least twenty percent savings compared to total energy so consumption for caps. And the current state of public lighting is still very much using sodium bucks. Okay. Last one. This is a uh, number ten ninety nine ninety nine from our city is that promulgating the protest building Danang environmental city in the periods of 2021 to 2030. And if here are some, de some details, some details, there are four details. First one, we continue to change communication work, raise people awareness about environment protection, change habits in application to the environment. The second one is that the main problem is the prevention, response, remedies, and improvement of environmental pollution. Next one, right, we prioritize early investment in environmental protects and strongly attract high tax environment friendly projects. The four is that 
capacity building and capacity timely and complete investment in monitoring system, forecasting tools, pollution control, online environmental data system. Oh, as you can see, um, number 104 from the CTE target to 2025. We target the total install capacity of the rooftop solar power in 1,609,540 megawatt. And uh, number one, 124 target to 2025. We build 150 electric vehicle tracking stations level one and level two. Uh, we build 15 level three electric vehicle tracking station. Uh, uh, sorry, um, about the idea of both station level one and level two, uh, from uh, 120 to 284. And level three electrical vehicle tracking station is from 600 to 800 volt. Okay. And uh, here are some problems that uh, this condition discussion from you. First one is coronavirus uh, epidemic, potential energy crisis. And the second one is electricity price in the countries and in the regions. Solar free in turn, right. And development in the technology using for the disposal of the industrial and domestic wastes. Okay. And um, our presentation here is enough. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chuan, for the slides and also the presentation in English. Uh, you shared uh, with us how Danan moves to a greener and low carbon city by issuing the policy and the regulations uh, to promote energy efficiency. Um, really glad to know that. Let's move to the ETH future city angle and welcome Ms. Uh, Narali Munga. Um, she is urban data specialist at Future City Lab Glo Global, uh, Singapore ETH Center. Uh, Ms. Narali Mungo is a design research coordinator so, um, at Future City Lab Globe. She holds a bachelor degree in architecture and a master degree in urban design from the National University of Singapore. Her work includes the transmissive uh, research uh, project in, in Indonesia, namely uh, in Jakarta, uh, Masaka, and uh, Zirabang. Zip, 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 their projects focus on the development of uh, interactive digital planning to work out UR scale. Um, for grounding evidence-based planning principles using diverse uh, uh, geospatial data set to address uh, complex challenges associated with uh, resilient urban uh, development. So um, my question for you, Narali, can you describe your innovative work of the integrated smart system you develop and what kind of data it would generate and how such data would help the city uh, to do their low carbon development. Thank you. Thank you, Jingming. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nirali, joining in from Future Cities Laboratory based in Singapore. 
In this presentation, I would like to showcase three projects based in Indonesia that use UrScape, our in-house digital planning tool, to foreground evidence-based planning principles addressing smart, smart system integration, climate change resilience, and pandemic resilience. Next, please. So UrScape is an interactive and visual planning support tool designed for rapidly urbanizing cities and regions where there is often a, exist a lot of data, but it's difficult to access and it's uneven in quality. So Eurascape was designed to support three key objectives, improve evidence base for planning across scales and as well as across sites, develop innovative forms of data collection, analysis and visualization, and as well as widen stakeholder partnership participation across domains and sectors to support transparent and collective decision making. Next, please. In this first case, uh, we developing we integrated the system for Bandung City. Bandung is the capital of West Java, located southeast of Jakarta. It's situated on an elevated plateau surrounded with volcanoes, with a population of 2.4 million and an 8.3 million population in the metropolitan region. The city had a range of existing data gathering infrastructure and smart technologies. The aim was to complement this existing system to facilitate horizontal connections between different domains, such as land use, fire safety, welfare, and public health, and at the same time, enhance the concerns and aspirations of the inhabitants. To do so, a framework was proposed that focused on identifying the uh, the focus on identifying a system that worked at grassroots level with limited ICT capacities, enhance the data collection and reporting process, and develop a city-wide database to give an overview of the data landscape. In this image, on the image to your right top, you can see the integrated system that's there in the Bandung city, where Uerscape complements the existing city reporting infrastructure. This project also involved a series of capacity building workshops with local stakeholders and actors. Next, please. In the second case, the Uerscape analysis supported the urban resilience assessment for Chiribon City. Chiribon is a large city region that sits on a low-lying land located on the northern coast of Java, and it is prone to sea level rise in the future. The main aim of this study was to identify vulnerable locations, assess their built, social, natural, and human capital, and review potential challenges from natural disasters. To identify these challenges, we use Uerscape to cross-analyze available spatial, thematic, social, and economic data sets. The image on your right showcases an example of Uerscape analysis. The panel on the left hosts the multi-sectorial data sets that are accompanied with a slider that facilitates dynamic and real-time interactions with the data. When activated, these data sets are visualized in the main window. Furthermore, the tools at the bottom provide analytical capabilities, such as cross-analysis of various data sets, assessing distribution and accessibility of urban services, municipal budget planning, simulating planning scenarios, and analyzing temporal data sets. In this Uerscape example, we use two data sets, location of urban poor settlements and sea level rise data shown in aqua blue. The intersection of these two data sets is highlighted in the yellow color, which identifies the most vulnerable population in the city with poor socioeconomic capacities that will be affected by sea level rise. Such assessments allow the government and the NGOs to target policies and resources in the most vulnerable areas. Next, please. In the third case, uh, we developed a guide for Makarsa City to leverage available data to better understand how pandemic was interacting with the city and its various dimensions, such as land use systems, public facilities, and infrastructure. Makassar City is located on the southern coast of Sulawesi Island, and it's the economic center of Eastern Indonesia. It functions as the primary trading port and has a population of 2.7 million in the metro region. The aim of the research was to identify spatial pattern of the pandemic, delineate vulnerable areas and communities, and prioritize areas for monitoring. We did this by using spatial, thematic, social, and economic data sets that were then validated with field-based experts and ethnography. 
This image on your right showcases an example of USCAP an analysis in which we overlay two data sets, COVID-19 clusters and water supply network data in the city. The intersection of the two data sets is highlighted in this yellow white color that helps to identify COVID-19 clusters in areas with poor water supply. This analysis can be used for planning the priority of water supply network in such areas that will facilitate the inhabitants to wash hands and combat COVID-19. In this way, such intersections and analysis can help identify potential policy focuses to address pandemic prone areas. Next, please. Using this process with URScape helps us to analyze and test urban and regional development scenarios, combine diverse kinds of data from multiple sources at multiple scales, enable quick and intuitive interactions with these data, build robust data foundations, and support transparent and collective decision making. Uscape is an in, designed as an intuitive open source software, and I encourage everyone to exp, uh, experiment with it. If anyone wants to use Uscape, you can download with these links shown in the slide. Thank you. Back to Jingming. Thank you very much, Narali. Glad to see the big potential of uh, using the smart technology to help the urban poor. Um, now let's open the floor for questions. I'm very glad to see there are quite a few questions already uh, on, on, on the, from the audience uh, at this uh, uh, chat box. Maybe I just uh, uh, read one and ask our panel to uh, answer. Um, I see one uh, about uh, Mongolia. Um, how have the lifestyle, including education or work style, changed in Mongolia? Uh, would the younger population be willing to stay or leave the place and have it changed or not by the project? How do you calculate the resilience in the area of uncertainty? I think the floor is yours, Arnold, please. Thank you, Tinning, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, well, it depends what is your baseline on the lifestyle. Um, but what I can say, of course, you know, things have changed a lot in Mongolia and, and mainly driven by the migration from the rural area to urban area. And, uh, and, and because of um, the climate change and economic uh, impact, then you have, you have now around the city of Mongolia, especially in Ulaanbaatar, a huge uh, trunk of the population which is living in the substandard urban area. So you can imagine if you come from a, a rural area to those kind of uh, urban setting, lifestyle it, it is um, uh, the impact on lifestyle is is uh, is huge. So so how you do that? How you how you uh, uh, stop the migration? Uh, and this is one of the key issues that we are trying to do here is to rebalance the development of the the country and render those uh, cities more attractive. Uh, and you mentioned uh, uh, education. Uh, I, I also forgot to mention that in this project, we have a kindergarten, we have dormitory for children, etc. So really, when you want to uh, rebalance the redevelopment and, and render the city more attractive, you have to embrace all the segment of the, the, uh, the, the urban services and to make sure that those cities are more attractive and to make the people to stay there. I am attacked by Tidming comments. <laughs> and... Uh, um, so, so yeah, so this is the main thing. And how, how, but we can talk a lot about that. And of course the mentality has changed a little bit. Now, how you measure, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, the resilience. Well, first you have to measure the, uh, the impact of climate change. Is an area is impacted by climate change. And if, the, uh, if, you, if you prove that the climate change has an impact on, on the area, and then uh, what you do, uh, will be used to mitigate this impact on this specific area. Then this is how you calculate the uh, resilience on, on a piece of land and on people uh, uh, also. Uh, okay, uh, sorry, it's, it's, it's a long discussion, but I have to be brief. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arnold. Really, it's a long journey. Uh, we need to do, it, to do it step by step and also uh, by observation and by doing. So uh, um, watch the... Uh, the work. So, and um, then uh, next question, also a very, uh, very good one. Um, 
how do you predict the negative impact of shifting of uh, decarbonization to labor market and the industrial structure? How do you measure the CO2 emission in the process of uh, producing the raw materials for solar panel and so on? So uh, who would like to answer this question? Anyone, you raise your hand? Otherwise I would ask, uh, is no real sound available here? Okay. Yes, I have a round. Yes. Yes. Now, floor is yours, no real sound. Yeah, uh, this first question is a bit difficult to, to comment for me. I'm not an expert on commenting on this, you know, industrial impacts of this decarbonization. So I should just uh, basically refrain from commenting on it. On, on the second point, um, as far as I know, there's no systemic, system, you know, systematic way for ADP at this point in calculating the CO2 emissions of the, of the raw materials. However, uh, in some projects, we started to look into this aspect as well. Like this uh, green and resilient you know, uh, housing project in Bhutan, we looked at like, uh, you know, the construction methodology, like a uh, use of local materials instead of imported materials to reduce the impacts, I mean, to reduce the impacts on the climate change. So, so those aspects have started to be, you know, looked into uh, in, in some of our projects. But, but this is, I think, one area that uh, we, can look, uh, we can look into further. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Norio san uh, Yes, uh, at least uh, we can start from this uh, do no harm. Uh, nobody uh, is clear how the impact on the uh, labor market would be uh, when, when we really uh, proceed with this uh, uh, decarbonization. But this is a trend to really help uh, deal with the climate change. I just, uh, um, okay, maybe I just move to the next one. Um, what would you please explain how these outcomes of research of the interaction between urban and rural uh, are applied to support their nomad? It seems still to Arnold, but maybe I would like to expand this uh, question a little bit to um, Na uh, Narali. Would you like to uh, say a few words about this uh, situation in Indonesia, uh, rural and urban areas? Uh, specifically, I know in uh, in, Masa, uh, in, in Makassar, you, you, you have uh, done this uh, very good uh, connection. So if you can say a few words, how uh, you, you apply your technology to rural and urban areas? Hi, Jingmin, thank you so much for the question. Um, as we mentioned that with using the USCAPE, we're able to uh, and we able to integrate a lot of multi-scalar and multi-sectorial data sets that transcend the jurisdiction boundaries as well and allows the planners to approach the decisions from a regional perspective. So when we are analyzing both the city and the re and the rural areas, then we can plan a more integrated way to address their, their address the problems in a holistic way and not see them in silos. So another way of uh, you, another potential of using the platform was to have these multiple domains of uh, land use, of transportation, water infrastructure, and even rural departments to talk to each other so that they can take a holistic approach to the decision making. Okay, very good. That's also a, a step by step way to implement this. Uh, um, I think that's a very good approach to manage the risk and achieve the best result. Just wonder if uh, um, Chen Kuan would like to say a few words. Uh, it's okay with you. Okay, so uh, would you like to say a few words, uh, Mr. Chuan, about this rural urban connection? and how uh, these uh, policies in Danan uh, has been applied in rural area or it has not been started in rural area yet. According to, according to our policies of the city, uh, we haven't applied it to rural areas, only some projects in urban, urban cities, yes. 
à, tức là chưa áp dụng vùng nông thôn chưa chưa vùng thôn vùng ít chưa vùng sâu ít chưa and uh, we are considering uh, we we'll apply this policies in long term and now we only uh, apply it in the urban okay okay or in our city yes we um, we haven't uh, applied it to rural areas yes thank you um uh, it's also good because the uh, urban area is the most energy uh, high consumption area. It's it's uh, it's good to start from the urban and then gradually to see how it can be applied in rural a area. Also, very good approach. Maybe one more question for uh, Narali. Uh, how did you collect the data and receive uh, consent from the uh, respondent during the last uh, data analysis? Um, for the both Makassar and Jerbon analysis that we did, the data was sourced from various public domains. So we had satellite data, remotely sensed data, some, uh, and the data also was taken in collaboration with the government departments. So whatever the city had locally available data, we were able to source it. So in terms of consent, we didn't directly had uh, from, we didn't have to approach the citizen themselves since the city was collaborating with us on those projects. So you have a very good uh, partnership with the uh, city government. So this, uh, all the, the data and the consensus come together for you to work as a, a whole team, big team with them, correct? Yes, correct. That would be Very good. And uh, now it's uh, come to the end of our session. Um, uh, thank you so much, all the panelists, uh, um, Mr. Chuan Kuan Chan, and Ms. Ms. Narali Mengo, um, Arnold Heckman, and uh, Norio Sang. Thank you so much for your great presentation and panel discussion. Uh, as we all say, it's a long journey to achieve this long, uh, low carbon and the resilient city development. Uh, yet requires all the key players as uh, we have been uh, presenting here from the financing partners, the municipal government, and also their uh, urban development uh, pioneers uh, to work together. And as uh, ADB has uh, committed to align its operation with the Paris Agreement and ensure all projects uh, activities uh, to um, automatically advance the low carbon, climate resilient and development pathways. Uh, let's uh, start with uh, uh, no harm, at least uh, to the agreement goals. Thank you so much, all the panelists and the presenters. Um, have a nice day and thank you for your participation and good questions to all the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Timing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you Bye -bye. to all the speakers and Ms. Jimmy for moderating the conversation. This is the end of thematic session five by ADB ADBI, Integrated Approaches for Low Carbon and Resilient Cities. Here's the next program. Channel one is thematic session seven, City to City Collaboration for Zero Carbon Society. And Channel 2 is thematic session 8, Low Carbon Solutions in Designing Sustainable Cities. Please go to the channel you wish to join. You can switch between channels using the button at the top of the screen. Now, we will be preparing the next stage, so please wait for a few minutes. <laughs>